Good morning, Suki Hotu. Welcome to this live Dharma sharing. On behalf of Satya Alam Sambodhi Buddhist Association, thank you for joining us. Happy greetings to all the brothers and sisters in the Dharma. I'd like to point out to you at this moment there is a PowerPoint file you can download to follow the presentation. These are the slides. Please take note of this link and you can obtain the presentation slides from this link and, and so that you can follow along the sharing and because I'll be using a lot of the slides. So let us begin this sharing by paying homage to the Triple Gem. Put our palms together and recite as follows. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami Sangang saranang gachami Dutiampi buddhang saranang gachami Dutiampi dhammang saranang gachami Dutiampi sangang saranang gachami Tatiampi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiampi dhammang saranang gachami Tatiampi sangang saranang gachami Pana tipata vermani sika padang samadhyami Adina dana vermani sika padang samadhyami Kamesu michachara vermani sika padang samadhyami Musa vada vermani sika padang samadhyami Sura miraya maja pamadatana Veramani sika padang samadhyami Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu Thank you very much and welcome And uh, please remember to download this sl these slides My f Okay, sorry uh, please remember to download these presentation slides to follow along today's sharing. The topic for today is calming emotional reactions. We're facing a lot of challenges these days, so we have to learn to be mindful that stress and distress can hurt us. And we have to learn how to relax, pause, relax and think in order to calm these emotional disturbances and to experience comfort, peace and happiness. Otherwise, we will be reacting emotionally to things that are happening around us and these emotional reactions will bring us a lot of suffering. And talking about suffering, in our last sharing, we spoke about physical suffering and mental suffering. And the big word is dukkha because the Buddha's doctrine, the fundamental teachings of the Buddha, basically they, this is the Four Noble Truths of Suffering. Unfortunately, the word Dukkha has not been well translated. It has been always translated as suffering, and it paints a negative picture about what the Buddha was teaching. A lot of people who are not familiar with the teachings of the Buddha, they say, oh, the Buddha is always talking about suffering. And Buddhism is so negative, so pessimistic. Well, that's not correct. The Buddha wasn't actually talking about suffering. The Buddha was talking about freedom from suffering. And the word Dukkha, because it was poorly translated as suffering, it painted an incorrect picture of what really Buddha was trying to teach us. Because it's a whole lot of other things, many different manifestations of Dukkha. When we encounter things which are uncertain, we feel insecure. So insecurity is dukkha. When we come across something not according to our wishes, we feel dissatisfied. So dissatisfactoriness is dukkha. 
when something traumatic happens and we experience pain and sorrow, of course that is very severe. But there are also other manifestations of dukkha. You know, we come across things that make us unhappy, things that didn't turn out the way we would like to. So that is unhappiness, that's dukkha. But most importantly, I would like to point out that it is stress and distress that we are constantly experiencing throughout the day. Stress is the physical suffering I spoke about last time. Distress is the mental suffering that we discussed also. So this is constantly happening to us, physical suffering and mental suffering and a whole lot of other things associated with them. So let's take a quick look at what makes us stressed. I have uh, grouped into three major categories, things that really make us stress. The first category is of course a very severe one, encountering emotional trauma, something very serious has happened and that is hurting us, causing a lot of pain and this will lead to the arousal of various negative emotions like fear, anxiety, worry, anger, ill will and so on. So this arouses very strong emotional reactions in us you know, and we often we feel pain and uh, agony. Right? The second category is basically things that don't turn out the way we, we would like them to. Adversities, problems, failures, disappointments. Things are not working out. So encountering problems, adversities, difficulties, troubles, obstacles, so on, right? all these make us feel, oh, it is such a big threat to us. So this really arouses negative emotions and making us very stressed and distressed. And of course, the last one is uncertainties, confusion, and feeling lost or even bored. And basically things are changing around us or unfamiliar circumstances, right? uh, unexpected events and so on. We have all, every single one of us around the world, in fact, billions of people have encountered this very severely in the past seven months with the coronavirus pandemic. A lot of uncertainties, even as of today, there is still a lot of uncertainties when all these pandemic problems will end, you know. There's no end in sight at the moment. Millions of people around the world um, are suffering, billions actually. So these are the three major categories. Let's take a look at things on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So when these events happen, they arouse our emotions. There is a part of the brain in our emotional brain called the amygdala. The moment it perceives something threatening, something that is in conflict, something that is basically hurting us one way or another, it actually produces a chain reaction. We call this the fight or flight reaction. When it senses something unpleasant, it actually produces these biochemical reactions in the body. So we go into this fight or flight reaction. And these stress hormones are hurting us and causing us to react according to that pain and suffering. But all this is necessary to help protect us. For example, uh, when somebody throws a basketball at us, for instance, approaching our face, we, ha we have no time to think. We cannot think, oh, the ball is coming. If I don't duck, it'll hit me. Or if I don't block it away, it's going to hit me and hurt me. We don't have time to think like that. We naturally react either to push it away and that is fighting or to duck and let it fly past and that is flight. So we fight or flight. And this is really helpful to us in a way for our survival. That's why the amygdala in this way is our bodyguard. But the amygdala can also be unnecessarily aroused by events that really are not really harmful, but somehow we perceive it as threatening. And this is when the amygdala arouses all kinds of emotions, right, leading to all kinds of emotions, and the amygdala actually becomes like a terrorist in our brain. So we have no control over this. No, no person in this world, 
maybe short of an arahant actually no hum, normal human being in this world has any control over how the amygdala reacts what we do have control over is what can we do about it after that how can we calm the amygdala down and when the amygdala reacts it uh, produces this biochemical chain reaction leading to this fight or flight reaction so the whole body get all tensed and all the organs behave in unusual ways and it hurts us physically and this is really the physical suffering we generally call stress we discussed this in the last sharing and this leads to mental suffering mental disturbances we call distress so so many things are happening around us day in and day out we don't realize it but it's constantly causing all kinds of trouble and i call this inevitable realities of modern life we are living in a very complex society today compared to our ancestors even our grandparents or our parents for that matter they were not in as complex a society as we are today right everything is happening online and uh, basically what what is troubling us is everything happening around us for instance environmental activities they constantly stimulate our sense organs distracting us and bombarding our attention system to pay attention to what's going on otherwise we get in trouble driving down the road if you don't pay attention to the traffic you can easily get into trouble but if you go back 40 years ago when people were driving down the road the road had not so many cars sometimes uh, you could easily uh, drive around without paying attention and not hit anything but today you can't do that there's too many cars around and things keep changing around us circumstances are always changing becoming unpredictable and this causes a lot of uncertainties and insecurity we feel insecure because things are not for sure things are uncertain and we are doing that right now every single one of us when we think about coronavirus pandemic we are feeling insecure what's going to happen next how can we get out of this and of course people around us our children our siblings our parents our teachers our bosses our our subordinates our our servants our friends neighbors whatever they impose their demands upon us and their expectations upon us and putting a lot of pressure on us to respond because if we don't respond we are creating quarrels so this is really a lot of things happening around us and we have deadlines always every one of us has deadline and schedules so people get tense and it drains our energy resources when we have to meet deadlines and of course we come across all kinds of troubles and all kinds of obstacles so all these are really hurting us causing us to perceive them as threats and conflicts we always think of these things as uh, threatening our peace of mind and in conflict with our wishes and desires all right so this is really cause us to perceive everything happening around us with a perception of threat and conflict and this is not very healthy right. now the buddha actually explained this emotional arousal very beautifully in this citta sutra at this point i would like to draw your attention to the fact that i'm very grateful to my teacher venerable dr punaji or the late bhante punaji who brilliantly translated the buddha's teaching from pali into english in a manner where he was able to discern what is going on in our mind the buddha used three words to describe the mind vinyana which means perception citta which means emotions uh, the affective process and mano which means thinking or the cognitive process so in this citta sutra bande punaji has translated emotions dominate the world emotions create distress emotion is that one thing to which all are spellbound which means it is our emotions which is really controlling our behavior and if we don't do anything about it it leads to distress mental suffering right and uh, 
we become spellbound by our emotions if we don't learn how to deal with it properly. And um, we're very thankful to Bhattipunaji being able to discern this translation because the Buddha used the word citta. Now, if you were to read other translations of this specific verse, you will come across mind dominates the world, mind creates distress, mind is that one thing to which all are spellbound. And if we were to look at this verse with the word mind, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But with the word emotions, it becomes so clear. It is our emotions which is controlling us. It is our emotions that is causing mental suffering. It is our emotions that is really put us into a spell, right? And if we don't do something about it, it gets out of control and it hurts us even more. And the Buddha calls this self-affliction of mental suffering. And you can find this in verse 42 of the Dhammapada, uh, where the Buddha said, whatever harm one enemy may do to another or one hater to another, One's ill-directed emotions inflict upon oneself a greater harm. So what did the Buddha mean by ill-directed emotions? And this is where the mind gets out of control. This is when our mental proliferation arises because imagination, memory, expectation arise and puts us under the spell. Iman imagination is thinking of something that hasn't happened yet. Memory is trying to recall something that is long gone, it's past. And expectation is trying to change something that is already right there in front of us. It's already happened right in front of us, yet we have expectations hoping to change things. So all these are really causing us to be more confused, more disturbed, and perceiving more threats and conflicts upon us and really hurting us. And that's why it's called self-affliction of mental suffering. So let's take a look at how this really affects us overall, our psyche. I call this the vicious cycle of emotions. So things are happening around us, stimulating our sense organs. This is the process of Panchakanda, the five aggregates. Then we're able to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. This is really one of the aspects of the mind, the vijnana part of the mind. We become aware of what we have seen, heard, smelled, taste, tasted, and touched from our sense organs. And from this sensory perception, we begin to interpret what is happening. So our interpre interpretation of our circumstances depends on what's going on. Now, if things were what I have described earlier, the inevitable realities of modern life, we would interpret them as threat and conflict. And when we come across things that appear to be threat or conflict, the way we interpreted it, it arouses our emotions. And when emotions are aroused, then it triggers this chain reaction in the body. So the body becomes uncomfortable. With bodily discomfort, it disturbs the mind. We call this distress, mental disturbance to the mind. And when that happens, if we don't learn to tame our emotion, we begin to behave in habitual emotional reactions. So our habitual emotional reactions take over and control us. And this leads to various forms of emotional arousals, greed, anger, fear, hatred, and so on. And if at this point we still don't do something about it, it actually gets totally out of control. And this is what the Buddha meant when he says, we are spellbound by our emotions. And this is self-affliction of mental suffering, allowing our imagination, memory, and expectations to get out of control. This is really a kind of clinging, a kind of personalizing, a kind of grasping of our experiences feeding our emotions with imagination, memory, and expectations, they call this mental proliferation, we're really caught deep in this emotional disturbance. We gotta do something about it. So what can we do about it? Because when the, all this is affecting our body, this is our stress reaction. And when all this are affecting our mind, this is our emotional chain reaction. We really must learn how to take care of both 
the physical suffering associated with stress reaction and the mental suffering associated with emotional chain reaction. In modern times, the modern psychologists have come up with what they call cognitive psychotherapy. So from modern psych psychologist's point of view, they have a solution. But amazingly, if you examine this solution, it is also exactly what the Buddha was teaching. So let's take a look at this. So when we interpret our circumstances as threats and conflict, it leads to emotional arousal. So the interpretation is done by our thinking mind, Mano, because we have control over this thinking. And the emotional arousal is happening with our citta, the affective process. This is our emotional arousal. This part we can't actually control, but we can actually calm and bring about some relief. But if we were to interpret things with threats and conflict, it arouses our emotions. And therefore, if we're able to change our interpretation, our cognition, mano, if we were to apply mano intelligently and able to change the way we interpret our circumstances, then emotional arousals can be calmed. This is the fundamental, uh, the fundamentals behind this cognitive psychotherapy. So cognitive psychotherapy basically in a, in a nutshell is to overcome emotional distress by changing unhelpful thinking. This is really what we can do. Changing unhelpful thinking can help us overcome this emotional distress, this mental suffering uh, that is so harmful, we become spellbound by it. So by perceiving our circumstances with peace and harmony, emotions are not aroused. And then we can remain calm and composed. And when you are calm and composed, you are able to think more intelligently. You're able to think more wholesomely how to solve a problem. Life is really about solving problems. We're constantly trying to solve problems. We're, unfortunately, we're distracted by this self-centeredness. We're just thinking how I feel. So how I feel is more important than solving the problem. This is really what's going on all the time. Now, the Buddha has uh, stated very clearly in this very first verse of Dhammapada, and we are using the translation uh, based on what Pantipunaji has taught us, where the Buddha stated, Mano Pubangama Dhamma. And see clearly, the Buddha was using the word Mano. So basically, the Buddha was talking about our thinking. So this is our cognition. And Pantipunaji has translated it as follows Cognition precedes all experiences, it predominates. And creates them. That means it's the way we interpret our circumstances, the way we think about what's going on. And that is really preceding our mental experiences. And it predominates our experiences. And in fact, it even creates our reality in life. So if we were to respond with vicious thought, if we were to speak or act with vicious thought, pain follows just as the carriage follows the animal. And this is really uh, very brilliantly portrayed by the Buddha where he described that pain following is like the wheel or the cart being drawn by the animal. The animal is suffering and having to draw this cart is more suffering because when you think of drawing a cart full of load, it's very hard work and it leads to suffering. So the Buddha actually used the metaphor of the cart and the wheel together with the animal, the, the, uh, the animal that is drawing it as a metaphor for suffering. Right? So we are suffering because it's like this animal having to draw this cart and the wheel is following. Because if we were to behave in an unwholesome way with vicious thought, if one were to speak or act, 
we will be experiencing what this animal is experiencing. Pain follows just as the carriage follows the animal. So can we do something about it? Now we were to look at some of the sayings of uh, some of the quotes from very famous psychologists. He, this is some, one from the past, a very well-known psychologist, one of the pioneers in psychology, William James. And he said, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose our thought, to choose one thought over another. Just a moment. <coughs> so basically, we have the ability to choose one thought over another. And this is what William James pointed out. So if we were to change the way we think, what happens? So now we look at the second verse of the Dhammapada, where the Buddha gave the opposite of the first verse. Cognition precedes all experiences, it predominates and creates them. With virtuous thought, that means thinking in wholesome ways, if one speaks or acts, happiness follows, just as one's inseparable shadow. Again, you can see here, Buddha very brilliantly used the shadow to represent happiness. Because happiness is not a burden, not like the cart following a cart or the wheel following the, the animal. It is really very light and it follows us. It is inseparable if we continue to think in virtuous way, wholesome way. When we speak or act, we apply virtuous thinking and therefore we will experience happiness because happiness is something that is light. It is not a burden and it is just as our inseparable shadow. So you can see the Buddha here used this shadow to represent happiness and he used the, the cart and the wheel of the ox or the, the animal to represent suffering. Notice that this Dhammapada verse 1 and 2 started off with Mano, Mano Pubangama Dhamma and Bhadipunanji has translated that, that as cognition. So this is one of the wonders, one of the greatest blessings I personally have experienced and a whole lot of people together with me, we have experienced this learning from Bhante Punaji. Very precise translations, not something based on traditional translations. Otherwise, this verse would have translated as mind precedes all experiences. Now, if you are not separating between thinking, which is cognition, mano, if you're not separate, separating that with emotions, which is chitta, uh, the affective process, then the message from the Buddha will not be so clear. Right? So here, this message is very clear. So our response is our choice in life, the way we respond to what's going on, whether we carry wholesome thoughts, virtuous thoughts, or we carry unwholesome thoughts or evil thoughts or vicious thoughts. And I would like to highlight a very powerful quote from another psychiatrist, psycho psychologist and psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl. He is the author of the book Man's Search for Meaning. He was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camp. He was a Jew. He was uh, trapped in the Nazi concentration camp for many years and he survived. And after he came, after the war, he wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. And this is a very powerful quote. He said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So what did he mean by stimulus and response? See, stimulus is things happening around us. It's affecting us. That is a stimulus. And then we think about it and then we respond to it. So he said, between stimulus, things happening around us, and our response to it, there is a space. So the word space here, he really meant a moment in time. There is an opportunity of that, just that moment in time. And in that moment in time, before we respond, 
we actually could choose our response. In other words, we have the power to think and choose what can we do about it. And it is our choice and our response that determines whether uh, determines our growth and our freedom and our happiness. So that space uh, Viktor Frankl was talking about is really a moment in time where we are able to think about what's going on and maybe change the way we interpret what's going on and then respond to it. So this is really a very powerful quote that we have this moment in time, this space where we can choose. How do we do that? And I have shared this many times before. I call this the three-step self-compassion. When things are happening around us and rousing our emotions, we get excited and right? we start to get upset. We, we, we know it when we start to get upset, just that many of us don't want to pay attention to it. We are more concerned with our own uh, self-centeredness. But if we were to pay attention, we know something is arousing our emotions. And when, when that happens, what can we do? The three-step self-compassion is first, pause. So in other words, when you feel your emotions are being aroused, don't react right away, just pause. And pause actually allows you to focus on that space, that little gap, that little moment in time when you can do something. So first, you allow time for your emotional excitement and your anxiety to calm down. And of course, your body is also flooded with these hormones. So allow these hormonal reactions, uh, biochemical chain reactions in your body to subside. And you can speed it along by relaxing. Take a deep breath and relax the body. And when you're able to relax the body, you can actually compose the mind. In other words, bring the mind to a state of calmness and able to then perceive things more accurately and you can choose your response. And this is really what Viktor Frankl was talking about. There is this space. Now you can expand this space. You can actually make this space clearer to you by pausing and relaxing. And now you choose your response. You apply the principle of think. T-H-I-N-K, that is really a acronym, I'll explain that in a moment. But you think, when you purposefully focus on wholesome and beneficial response to the problem. This is what think is all about. You think about how you can respond in such a way where it is wholesome and it is beneficial. And it solves the problem, like I said. Life is about problem solving. Life is not about seeking the truth. It's not about who's right or who's wrong. It's about how can we make this situation better for the both of us. If something happens between us, how can we do something to make this situation better than for the both of us? Not trying to prove who is right, who is wrong. Not trying to exert our ego and say, oh, I'm stronger than you, I'm more important than you, and so on. So this is really learning how to pause, relax, and think. And this relaxed part, the breathing is so powerful, so important. It is breathing is this most critically overlooked relaxation tool. It easily relaxes the body and calms the mind. A lot of people don't realize that. How, how does that work? It increases natural and forced oxygen intake, and oxygen is food for your cells. So your cells become more energized. Right? <coughs> and it stabilizes heart rate. That means your heart is not beating erratically and stabilizes your blood pressure and it regulates your body temperature and blood circulation and it restores and maintains this condition called homeostasis homeostasis is referring to this bodily stability your body is now stable all right so when your body is stable then you are able to calm down and relax so this re restores and maintains homeostasis because if homeostasis is not maintained and not restored then your body is agitated then you are in a deep state of stress and breathing also calms the nervous system this is powerful it indicates absence of threat because when your nervous system is calm then it is not focusing on what is threatening it is basically letting go 
and finally it brings your attention and your awareness to the present moment right here and now focusing on this space this moment in time where you can think and do something and this is why breathing is such a powerful relaxation and calming uh, tool right? so learn how to slow down your breathing now if we were to ask ourselves about breathing how fast are we breathing just ask yourself breathing in now and breathing out how fast are you breathing most of us right now I'll just give you an example breathing in breathing out in out isn't this our normal pattern so this is about three seconds now learn how to slow it down LSD breathing means consciously allow breathing to slow down and this helps to relax the body and calm the mind this is really a very powerful relaxation tool and calming tool allow your breathing to slow down consciously do not exert effort don't force it simply allow in other words just let the breathing go on so LSD L means long allow breathing to flow longer typically four or five seconds initially and once you get used to it you can then stretch it to five or six seconds later on so begin by letting your in breath take four to five seconds and same with your out breath so just allow it to flow longer so as you do that you now give it a while and as you do that gradually then you begin to slow it down further and it becomes very smooth and this is where the S comes in slow and smooth allow breathing to go on naturally and effortlessly don't force it just allow it and as your breathing slows down to five seconds finally you begin to take in a little bit deeper as you breathe in just take it in a little bit deeper as you breathe out just release it a little bit deeper so in make it deeper breathing in and breathing out allow fuller breaths in and out effortlessly don't force it so this is LSD breathing and this will definitely help you relax the body and calm the mind this is a very powerful breathing technique very simple you can do this anywhere anytime you're riding in a bus sitting in a taxi or standing in the queue waiting for something just allow your breathing to slow down and I do that it's almost like a 24 7 practice by now because if you if you do that regularly you'll find yourself being able to <clears throat> do it <clears throat> with 24 7 now don't mind me I have a lot of phlegm <laughs> it's not cough it's it's actually phlegm so what can how can we apply all this to this vicious cycle of emotions well let's examine vicious cycle of emotions quickly one more time as things happening around us we begin to interpret things as threat and conflict because it's not according to the way we want it and, and it arouses our emotions when emotions are aroused the body is disturbed the body becomes uncomfortable and we begin to react with habitual reactions if we are not mindful and leading to mental suffering and even mental proliferation and then we are spellbound by our emotional reactions what can we do about it well we can transform this vicious cycle of emotion into a virtuous cycle of composure simply by being a little bit more mindful about what goes on in the body see this practice of mindfulness uh, those of you who do meditation you know satipatthana meditation the four foundations of mindfulness the first foundation is kayanu pasana this is your bodily activity so be mindful of what's going on in your body that means when your heart rate is going up realize that your heart is now beating faster and when your breathing is deepening see when you are emotionally emotionally aroused your breathing is very uh, hasty <sighs> like that right all your muscles are now tensed your facial expression all distorted and you're feeling heat you know especially around the neck 
because uh, you know blood is rushing to the brain so all this is uh, causing you to to experience this stress this tension so when you realize your body is being stressed when you realize that somehow your emotion must have been aroused because you are mindful about bodily activities what do you do pause relax and think so don't react right away realize that all this happening pause don't react right away and just relax take deep breathing LSD breathing and when you are able to do that then you begin to think about how you can overcome this problem how can you solve this problem by thinking in a more wholesome way right so the first thing you have to do is change your interpretation of what's going on because it's your interpretation of threat and conflict is causing a lot of trouble so if somebody were to say something nasty to you very often we interpret that as some kind of a threat or conflict when someone says something nasty to you but if you were to interpret it with differently right so if you were to change your interpretation to peace and harmony then you can actually calm down the emotions very quickly if we can change our interpretations we can tame our emotions so how do you change perception of threat and conflict into perception of peace and harmony when somebody is saying some nasty things to you simply put when someone is saying something nasty to you there must be a reason so when you first perceive it as threat and conflict you want to fight back or you want to run away from it but if you were to think of it as maybe this person has something to tell me not just his nasty words you ask that person oh, what do you mean by that can you explain it further you know why are you thinking this about me you know so you can ask them to clarify so this is really a peaceful and harmonious response initially the way you interpret it is now maybe you want to find out more right so this is really how you can change the way you interpret circumstances and not just think of it as a threat and a conflict right up front right? so when you can do that you find that you become more emotionally composed your mind is not now caught in deep emotional arousals and your body can become relaxed and when your mind is composed and your body is relaxed you have a very good chance of improving the situation so respond to it using the principle of think and respond with purposeful wholesome response to the problem and this will help you cultivate wellness comfort peace and happiness in your life if you learn how to respond to every problem with the perception of peace and harmony so that you become more composed and relaxed and you respond with purposeful wholesome response to the problem using the think t-h-i-n-k principle then you are cultivating wellness comfort peace and happiness in your life think t-h-i-n-k it's a very simple technique very helpful uh, it's very brilliantly thought about uh, I didn't come up with this, but uh, I adjusted it slightly because uh, the I is sometimes mm, interpreted differently. So, T. T is it truthful, right? And H is it helpful? I. I means will it improve the situation? And N means is it really necessary? And finally, K means is this kind or. Uh, this is a kind act of speech so T truthful before you speak or act ask yourself what you're about to say is that really something truthful now when somebody says something nasty to you your emotions are aroused and you react back by shouting all kinds of things to that person that is not truthful you know you're trying to hurt that person because you want to protect your ego but think about what you are saying to that person make sure that it is truthful don't start insulting people don't start screaming at people and the important thing is to help you recover from the situation 
and adapt to it. So H for helpful. This will help you recover from the situation. Think about what you are saying. Will it really help? Right? Is it helpful? And I improve. Will it improve the situation? Will it improve the relationship? So when you respond with T-H-I-N-K, you will find yourself practicing wholesome response, peaceful and harmonious. And often realize that N, not everything, it may be the truth, but not everything is necessary to say. You know, if somebody, let's say, in my, my case, for example, you know, I'm quite chubby. So if somebody also almost as chubby, maybe not so much, says to me, Oh, Billy, you look so fat. And I, ha I react emotionally. Maybe the first thing I shout back at him is, uh, Oh, you think you're very skinny. And then we start ending up in some argument, right? But is it really necessary to respond like that? Ask yourself. Sometimes it may be truth, uh, truthful that that person is also chubby, but is it necessary to say it? So if it is not necessary, don't say it. But the most important of all, T H I N K, is the last one, K. Everything you, every thought you carry, every speech you make, and every action you take, always do it with kindness. So think with kindness, speak with kind words and act with kind deeds. T-H-I-N-K. So this is something very helpful for us to remember and apply in our daily activities and daily interactions with people. You know, one of the best ways to respond to an insult or to some nasty words is to respond with a question. Ask that person to clarify then you are trying to find out more truth about what's happening. Is what that person is saying to you the truth too? So clarify, ask questions. I learned this from... Uh, okay, I, I learned this windows of opportunity. Right? From Daniel Goldman, the author of uh, many books on... Uh, emotional intelligence. He basically described that when emotions are aroused, when the amygdala is all active and we've, we are feeling all tensed and stressed, by remaining calm and relaxed, we have three windows of opportunity to reduce stress, to solve the problem. First, of course, this is the ideal solution. If something goes wrong, the best thing to do is to change it, get rid of it, get rid of the problem. So change your circumstances. In other words, if something is not according to the way you want, get rid of it, move it away and replace it with something. If you can do that, but we are not always blessed with the opportunity to change our circumstances. Classic example, coronavirus pandemic. Can we change our circumstances? No, we can't. We are stuck. We're stuck with this. We're going to do something else. We can't get rid of it. Right? Nobody, not one single person in the world can get rid of it. So what else are we left with? The second window of opportunity, change how we perceive our circumstances. By doing that, changing the way we interpret what's going on, by changing the way we perceive what's going on with the perception of peace and harmony, we are able to find inner peace and calmness and comfort. We are not aroused and reacting, right? so we're able to find some comfort. And finally, change the way we respond. By changing the way we respond, we can actually gain control over our lives. We don't allow the circumstances to dominate our life. We are able to change the way we respond so that we can find better ways to be happy and peaceful and calm. So these are the three windows of opportunity we have. I would like to share with you a simple uh, experience I've had when I was a young, much younger. I was working for a very large multinational company. They pay very well. But there was one time when I was assigned to a department. It was run by a local chap who somehow, he must be having all kinds of problems at home. 
very nasty fellow. Every time we do something not according to his wishes, he would scream at us and shout at us. Even if we did something good and produced good results, he wouldn't say a word. He wouldn't say thank you. He would say, ah, that's your job. You know, you don't feel appreciated. And at the same time, even the slightest thing that you don't do according to his wishes, he starts bombarding you with all kinds of threatening words. So it can be very stressful and people are getting all stressed. So I can't change uh, my circumstances. I mean, I can't get rid of him. You know, I'm not his boss, so I can't fire him. And I don't want to kill him. <laughs> so I can't change my circumstances. So what do I do? I change the way I perceive what's going on. So when he was shouting and screaming, every time he would shout and scream over small little things, I always perceive it as, ha, huh, gorilla escaped from the zoo, <laughs> you know? So when you think about this person screaming at you as some kind of a gorilla that escaped from the zoo, you know, I began to smile a little bit. And that's why he was wondering every time he shouted at me and he see me smiling. So why am I smiling, you know? But in my mind is gorilla escaped from the zoo. So this is changing the way you perceive what's going on. Don't perceive him as threatening you or, or trying to hurt you. Perceive it as, you know, this fellow is crazy, you know? And in fact, that helps me to cultivate a bit of inner peace and calmness. So I smile even, and he was wondering. So when he realized that I'm smiling, he doesn't shout at me so much anymore. And also change the way you respond. So when he calms down, after all the shouting, and he calms down, and things are almost as good as normal, you can walk up to him and say, Ah, boss, I'm making a cup of coffee. Would you like one? I'll make one for you. When you treat people with kindness, it's the most powerful way to respond to people who are unkind. You know, people who are unkind, they fear kindness. I think there's an ancient Chinese saying about that. You know, you can hurt me or harm me, but when you're kind to me, I'm most afraid of you. I'm really afraid of you when you're kind to me. So in this sense, practice kindness. And then he will start to think, oh, uh, when I get upset with him, he still comes and make me a cup of coffee. He's such a nice fellow. Maybe I shouldn't scream at him so much. And this helps. It will reduce his response. Right? So now let's take a look at uh, this coronavirus pandemic. What's going on? So every one of us is experiencing the circumstances that we cannot change. So how can we help ourselves? Well, here is another very powerful quote from Viktor Frankl, where he said, When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. In other words, change the way we perceive our circumstances, change the way we respond to our circumstances. So how can we change the way we perceive this coronavirus pandemic? When it started in March, mid-March, when everybody was in quarantine, we were not allowed to leave the house. You see, what happened is for some years, my two daughters, they are living with us in the house, but they have been very busy with their careers. So they are always coming home quite late. And by the time they get home, they're very tired. There's no time to spend time to bond. And only occasionally on weekends, we might find some time together. But otherwise, most of the time, we don't spend a lot of time together. So during those two months, two to three months, when everything was locked down and we were all under quarantine, not allowed to leave the house, well, we all stayed at home and we were happily cooking. So we perceived that as, a, as an opportunity to bond. So same thing, I think many of you are doing that. And some people perceive it as an opportunity to, to improve their cooking. <laughs> because we have to stay at home and do some cooking. We're only allowed to go to the nearby supermarket once a week, that kind of thing. And that's the only time we go out to get some groceries and then we, we do cooking. Some people perceive it as an opportunity to improve their cooking. Some people perceive it as an opportunity to expand on their hobbies, which they do at home, you know, stitching, sewing, or painting or drawing or making music, whatever that they can do at home. So change the way you perceive your circum circumstances. And now with the lockdown being less strict, we're allowed to move around a bit more. Change the way you respond to this coronavirus pandemic. Make sure that when you go out, 
always wear face masks and make sure that every opportunity you have wash your hands thoroughly and carry with you sanitizers and also very importantly social distancing keep your distance away from people at least six feet away or two meters and stay away from crowd and this is changing the way you respond to your circumstances I'd like to finish off with a very quick one, uh, just another 10 more minutes. A very simple thing about meditation, bhavana, and this is what Bhante has been teaching us. It is by being conscious all the time that we can control our emotions. What he meant by being conscious is to apply our cognition, mano pubangama dhamma, right? Cognition. Our cognition actually uh, precedes our experiences so uh, apply the thinking so that means sharpening our thinking mind and this is what meditation is all about sharpening our our cognitive power and calming stilling our emotions that's really what uh, what meditation is all about and the first things we learn from any meditation teacher is to learn to tame the five hindrances what are the five hindrances? They are emotions. They are emotional reactions. So that's really what meditation is about. Sharpening our consciousness and taming our emotional reactions. So the constant practice of being conscious is what the Buddha called development or bhavana. Development of the mind. To purify the mind. I want to share with you some simple techniques. A lot of people, when they try to meditate, and then they start saying, oh, I can't meditate, I, I'm very sleepy, I easily doze off, or, oh, my mind is jumping, flying around like a monkey, jumping from tree to tree. So, the, you know, because they don't prepare, they're not preparing to meditate, not preparing themselves. So I've come up with a very simple four steps, four simple steps to prepare yourself when you want to meditate. Of course, the first thing, find yourself in a comfortable posture. Make sure that you are seated in a soft posture. Not all tensed up, just something comfortable. Centralize your sitting bone so that you are, you are sitting straight on top. And straighten your back. Right? And I have a technique to, to help you to straighten your back easily. But then you learn how to relax by releasing tensions all around you. Because when we first sit down, there's some tensions in our hands, our arms. There's some tensions in our forehead, our eye sockets, uh, our cheek. There's some tension. Just consciously release them before you start to meditate. All these are before you start to meditate. So releasing muscle tensions all over your body. And then slow down your breathing a little. That is where LSD breathing comes in. Very, very helpful. Start slowing down your breathing first before you begin to meditate. Because if you begin to meditate with breathing, hasty breathing, uh, you will be agitated. You will not be able to be comfortable and, and still your body and still your mind. So allow the breathing to slow down a little bit. And this will help you. And of course, bring your attention inwards. And only when you are ready, bringing your attention inwards, we call this introspection. When you are ready, you're relaxed, you are composed, and your breathing is now slow and smooth, bringing your attention inwards, now you can begin to meditate. So it's very helpful if you follow these four steps to help yourself prepare for your meditation. Always, every time you begin to meditate, do that. Now I'm going to share with you some simple techniques. This one, uh, I got this from Bhante Pema Ratana. Some of you may have remembered him. S always sit on top of your sitting bone. Because if you don't, you will find your body very tired. Because like the one on the left, you will see your body, your, your backbone is arched. Your body becomes more tense as you go along with the meditation. Always sit on top of your sitting bone by rolling your butt on uh, the surface. And you realize where that sitting bone is. And then straighten up. Sit on top of that. Now I'm going to teach you a simple but helpful technique to straighten your back without uh, applying too much effort. I'll just switch the screen to a bigger one. Okay, 
what happens is when somebody says straight when we say straighten your back what do most people do they, uh, they, they, they put some tension they put some some uh, uh, you know put some force or some tensions on their muscle they tense their muscle in order to pull the back uh, that is not helpful here is a simple technique that you don't have to apply any force or any tension first right you learn to roll your shoulder forward three times gently slowly don't do it fast just gently three times and you will hear a little bit of crack 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 in the beginning but after a while it will it will not be there anymore and then the next thing you do it in reverse three times all right all the crack 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 is happening slowly don't force it just do it gently and slowly do it naturally so there's no force don't force it and then you repeat the forward three times very slowly all this will only take one minute and now after repeating that three times now each time you do that you actually breathe in as you roll and then pause and breathe it out now for the fourth one as you breathe in you just raise your shoulder a little bit and pull it back slightly and just allow it to come down gently don't force it and when you do that you will find yourself sitting perfectly straightened back your back is perfectly straight so and that is how you can straighten your back naturally with this simple shoulder exercise without applying force without make putting in that physical effort without tensing your muscle this is actually a relaxation technique not a tensing tension technique right so roll forward roll backward roll forward raise it up and pull it back slightly and just allow it to fall down and follow the breathing pattern according to that so this I, this is also very helpful not only when you start to meditate as you are meditating sometimes after some time and you start to feel a bit groggy a bit sleepy well do this when you do this your attention is back to the present moment you actually bring yourself back to the present moment so when you're feeling a little bit groggy and, uh, and a little bit sleepy you know dinamita strikes and that is when you can do that or your mind is running away like a monkey jumping from tree to tree and and this is when udacha kukucha strikes your mind is restless agitated all this agitation and restlessness do this and then after doing this you then follow it with slowing down your breathing and when you're able to do that now your mind becomes very clear your mind is very focused and very clear when you are able to do this so I hope these techniques have been helpful to you help you to relieve all the stress and tension help you to relax and be comfortable and compose yourself to be able to respond to whatever is happening in front of you respond with peace and harmony right let's summarize what we have covered so far calming emotional reactions recognize this reaction in your body the stress reaction freeze fight or flight reaction causing bodily discomfort that means be mindful to changes in the body and then begin to realize that if you don't do something this physical suffering will lead to mental suffering stress leads to distress if you don't calm down relax your stress right away so you need to really calm down simply by relaxing and how do you relax you pause relax and then think and realize that there are three windows of opportunity for you to decide change your circumstances change the way you perceive your circumstances or change the way you respond to your circumstances and then mindfully just perceive things with peace and harmony always remember that we easily fall into the trap our ego drags us into this trap of perceiving things as threat and uh, and conflict because the ego wants to protect the self so it begins to uh, interpret things around us as threat and conflict it's constantly doing that and the amygdala gets aroused but if you to, were to change your perception to peace and harmony it will help and finally with every thought with every speech 
and with every action, always consider T-H-I-N-K for a peaceful response. Is it truthful? Will it help? Will it improve the situation? Is it really necessary? And most importantly, is this a kind speech or kind act? All right. So I hope that is helpful. I'll just finish off with the last couple of slides. And the Buddha has been teaching us in Mangala Sutra, when the Buddha says, when faced with changing vicissitudes of life, Changing vicissitudes of life is referring to all the things happening around us that is not uh, according to the way we want. It's always changing. Right? It, 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 anicca, things are impermanent. It's always changing. And very often, it's bringing dukkha. And when we become self-centered, anatta, so we have to realize these three, right? that we should not be self-centered. That is the essence of anatta. Don't be self-centered. So when faced with changing vicissitudes of life and we're experiencing all kinds of emotional arousal and stress and distress, if emotion can be stilled and remain undisturbed, free from grief, cleansed of defilement, liberated from fear, this is the most supreme bliss. And this is in the Mangala Sutra. So this is really very important essence that the Buddha is teaching us learn how to calm your emotions and it's only when you're able to do that you're able to bring some stillness and peace in your life and I would like to finish off with a word of deep gratitude to my teacher the late Bhante Punaji and I'm always reminded by this so that everything I do is very focused in, on solving the problem the purpose of human intelligence is not to discover the truth, but to solve problems. So when something happens and hurts you, it's not to figure out who's right, who's wrong. That's not the thing. Think of how, what you can do to solve the problem, to bring more peace and harmony into your life. Right? With that, I end my presentation. I hope this has been helpful. The, don't forget to download the presentation slides for the latecomers. You can go to that link and you can download the presentation slides. Right? If you have any questions, you can put it in the comment now. I'll just check and see if there's any comment, any questions. So far, none. Uh, oh, Angeline had posted a comment. Yes, change the way we respond to circumstances. Yeah, that's it. And so far, I don't see any questions. So I, if you have, please post it uh, as a comment under this. And so that uh, I can answer now if you want to. Otherwise, if you have any questions later on, please drop me an email or you can go to Facebook and message me. And so my Facebook link is there. My email is there. You can drop me an email later. So there's still no more questions at the moment. All right, so I shall end this presentation. Let us uh, end this presentation by sharing our merits, remembering that we spent the last one hour together and we have shared the Dharma and this has helped us accumulate good merits. And we realize that there are a lot of people around the world, especially those who are experiencing the intense problem of the coronavirus pandemic, they are suffering. So let us put our palms together and recite as follows to share our merits with all the people who are suffering from the coronavirus pandemic. We dedicate the merits we have acquired from sharing the Buddha Dharma to all beings affected by the coronavirus pandemic around the world. May suffering beings be suffering free. May the fear struck fearless be. May grieving beings shed all grief. May all beings find peace and relief. By the grace of the merits we have acquired, may we never follow the foolish. May we follow only the wise until we attain the highest and most supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So that is the sharing for today. 
I am very happy to have this opportunity to share the Dharma with all the brothers and sisters and friends. And I thank the people at Satya Alam Sabodhi Buddhist Association for allowing me to share this on their Facebook page. And this is the third in the series. So if you are interested to watch the whole series, go back to that same uh, go down and see the other videos. The first one was on Four Noble Truths Simplified. The second one is on physical and mental suffering. And this is the third one on calming emotional reactions. And with this, I big farewell for now, just a short one. And uh, I wish you, all of you, please stay safe. May you and your family be well, comfortable, peaceful and happy. Sadu, sadu, sadu.